You shall know them by their fruit. I have a lot of favorite half verses I hear often. One of them, you shall know them by their fruit. It's used to express the idea that somebody cannot possibly be a Christian because of something they've done. And I will tell you, I think it's a common sentiment among Christians that certain conduct, besides rejecting the gospel, categorically excludes someone from being a Christian. In short, a real Christian can't do that. You might fill in a blank. A real Christian can't do what? If I read my Bible right, there's virtually nothing that they can't do. But there are, I mean, even, even not just within Calvinism, but just in general, our reaction. But I, I ask this question, what sin is a Christian incapable of doing? You know, if a person murders someone else, does that prove they're not a Christian? How about if they're a drunk? They struggle with a drug addiction. They have sexual sin in their life. Many believers think certain sins prove somebody is not a believer. I will suggest something to you. If you get down in Romans chapter 1 and get sort of toward the end, you find all kinds of terrible, terrible sins not one of us in this room would ever do. Paul says, envy, debate, deceit, gossip, backbiters, proud, boasters, disobedient to parents. You know, when I think of the heroes of the faith even, we have Noah, who was a drunk on many occasions, and there was more to that that I won't say here. Abraham, who on at least two occasions offered his wife to another man because he didn't believe God's promises. Jacob was a swindler. Moses had an anger problem, and in Egypt he murdered a man. He was wanted. That's why he had to flee the jurisdiction. David had multiple wives. He had an affair with a lady, and in order to hide her pregnancy, he killed her husband. Solomon saturated himself with stuff, with women, and he permitted rampant idolatry at the temple complex, just to name a few of the things he engaged in. Someone will say, well, yeah, I mean, a Christian can sin, but they can't continue sinning. Why not? You know, the Bible says that Lot was a just man, according to 2 Peter 2.7. He was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Why? Because he lived right in the middle of them. But if the history of Genesis is any indication, his actions are hard to defend at any point in his life. He planted himself in Sodom. He stayed there while it consumed his family. After leaving it, he committed incest while drunk. I mean, it's difficult to isolate the good things he did. And yet I can't deny the biblical witness that he was a saved man. And you say, well, he, he, maybe he wasn't always bad. What about Samson? We search the life of that judge and try to find something we can say, here he is doing the right thing for the right reasons, except it's hard to find that he ever did that. He violated his Nazareth vows, defied his parents, engaged in rampant sin. He was prideful, extraordinarily violent. He persisted in his ways all the way to the end of his life. And it was his internal rage, his appetite for revenge, for which he committed suicide in the end to take out just a few more bad guys. Um, the issue is not whether there are consequences for uh, a Christian who lives in, in such a way, but whether or not certain behavior shows us you can't possibly be a believer. And I would, I would hasten to add here that I think every Christian persists in some type of sin until they die. We need to let that sink in. This mantle of the Pharisees that many have taken in our day by happily condemning those they think are too sinful to be believers is a tremendous plague on Christianity. We engage in this fruit inspection business. We always set ourselves up as the standard, looking down at the other end of the pew. We focus on our perceived persistent sin in someone else. And we think of the biggies. We think, well, they've got this or that addiction or whatever we may think of. Um, we choose those things that we're pretty confident no one would think that we would do that. We become the Pharisee, and he stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers are even as this publican. It's Luke eighteen eleven. But what if those around us actually knew the whole truth about us? Like a little video camera running in the house so they can catch what you say about the people at church when you're at home. Oh, 
What if they knew what we really think? What if they knew that we remain prideful? We still enjoy good gossip sometimes. We have inner thoughts about others that should not be there. We fail to properly channel our anger even in simple situations like when someone cuts us off in traffic. We make unkind responses to our spouse. We say words of ridicule to our children because we had a bad day at work. Let's go one further. Let's just sort of turn, turn the screws a little more. What if they knew exactly how much I give at church relative to my income? What if they knew that I hadn't provided food and clothing to any destitute people in 10 years? What if they knew that outside of church I have a critical spirit towards some people at church? And I'm not just talking about me. We have a lot of holy people here, and I know none of them have done any of this. But I'm telling you, this fruit inspecting business is a dangerous, dangerous standard. And within this Calvinism, we have a doctrine that sets us up for it. We've talked about yesterday part of this thing called TULIP. TULIP starts with T for total depravity. It says people are so lost that they cannot, of, in and of themselves, believe the gospel. In fact, faith would have to be given to them. Uh, a Calvinist would say that faith is itself a work, and since you cannot be saved by works, you cannot be saved by faith unless God gives it to you. In fact, people are so lost, they can't even comprehend the gospel. They can't understand anything of God. They cannot do anything that pleases God. Unsaved people are incapable of even loving others. That is what total depravity says. Given this state of affairs, the only way anyone's ever going to be with God is if he picks some out to save. And he has only picked some, a very small number, relative to all the people who would ever live. And those he picked before he even created the solar system and the universe, we call that unconditional election. It's the U and TULIP. He picked those he would save. The L is limited atonement. He died exclusively and only for those people he picked to save. The I in TULIP is irresistible grace. At a moment in time of his choosing, he gives you your faith so that you cannot reject the gospel. You must understand it, and you must believe. And lastly, having done all those things, you will persevere, not only in the faith until the day you die, but you will persevere in fruitful obedience. And were you to waver and have some period of time, especially near the end of your life, that uh, you are not uh, meeting some standard, and it's unclear who sets the standard and who's calling balls and strikes, but if you don't meet it, you have established that you never really believed to begin with. You had something called spurious faith. I want to read one definition from a Reformed theologian of the past named Augustus Strong, and it'll be on a, a slide on the screen. This is him defining perseverance of the saints. The scriptures declare that in virtue of the original purpose and continuous operation of God, all who are united to Christ by faith will infallibly continue in a state of grace and will finally attain to everlasting life. This voluntary continuance on the part of the Christian in faith and well-doing, and don't miss that, in faith and well-doing, we call perseverance. Perseverance is therefore the human side or aspect of that spiritual process which is viewed from the divine side we call sanctification. It's not a mere natural consequence of conversion, but involves a constant activity of the human will from the moment of conversion to the end of life. We talk about sanctification sometimes. It's a word used in the Bible. It means to be set apart, but it's the idea that we ought to be as Christians growing and maturing, learning the Word of God, applying it in life, and becoming a better Christian, to becoming someone who's more and more devoted to God. And we call that process sanctification. What perseverance of the saints is saying, if I don't see that all the way to the end of your life on a consistent basis, you're not a believer. Now, part of this says you can't lose your salvation. I agree with that. The question is, will you always live as a good Christian, and will you do it consistently? Will there never be any period of time when it just seems like you've went off track, uh, particularly for any extended period? And, and they would say, if that happens, proves you were never saved to begin with. That's a big claim. It's a really big claim, and we need to start at the beginning because even though it sounds like we're looking at somebody's life and how do they live and are they good enough, by the way, you would never know if you're good enough. You can't know. But what we're really talking about is something that happens at the beginning. When you first trust Christ, what does that even mean to trust Christ? What is, what is faith? See, if, if 
God gives you the faith, and if the faith he gives you isn't merely believing, but it's a wholehearted commitment to always obey Christ, and God's giving you that, it's just inevitable. You can do nothing but live a life of obedience pretty much at all times. After all, the faith didn't hang on what you did, but on the faith that God gave you. See? How I define faith matters a lot. If I inject good works into that term faith, and I say God gave that to you, good works and all, you're going to live a certain way. So we ask the question, what is faith? You would think it would be easy. It's something I'd mentioned the other day. Words matter a great deal when you read your Bible, and it's sometimes uh, seemingly simple words that, that it, a lot can change or a lot can turn on how we define it. In plain everyday English, English and I got this the old-fashioned way, by the way, uh, I looked at a dictionary, and I didn't go online for it. So there's still uh, some folks own those. It's not a bad place to start. You're reading a good translation of your Bible. You get a word, uh, maybe an archaic word sometimes. Open the dictionary, see what it says. I looked up faith in my uh, volume one of my dictionary. said confidence or trust in a person or thing. That's actually what I thought it was. Belief in the truth of a statement or doctrine. That's also what I thought faith was. Well, uh, there are Greek dictionaries. We call them lexicons, and I've looked in the, the leading Greek lexicon to see what faith means when it's used in our Bible. Uh, do know this, um, Greek, like some other languages, but not so much like uh, English, you can change uh, a, an ending on a root of a word and make it a noun or a verb. So you almost have the same word for faith, which is a noun, is the word for believe, which is a verb. So it's really, when you read believe in your Bible, it's almost always the idea of faithing, if you can make it a verb. It's to have faith in. They're almost the same thing. So this dictionary in, in the Greek for the word faith, the noun, it says this, that which evokes trust and faith. Secondary meaning, a state of believing on the basis of the reliability of the one trusted. Trust, confidence, faith. That's also what I already thought it meant. Then I looked up the verb believe in the same dictionary. It said to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. Believe. It turns out it means the same thing in the Greek as it does in the English. And this is important because I'm telling you that the way we get to this perseverance of the saints doctrine is we redefine this key word. Because you can't find a verse that guarantees that people who are Christians will do the right thing all the way up until they die. Because, in fact, you can look at the life of Solomon, and you can look at the life of Samson, you can look at Gideon and a whole bunch of other people, and maybe, and, and maybe even people in this day and age, and who, who, even people who've done a lot of good things, and something happens. And I've watched it happen in some lives, and, and they seem off track. But I never say, well, they weren't a believer. That's the reason there's no verse that says that, because we're human beings and we're not perfect. But you say, what is faith? Charles Ryrie defines faith, and I want to read his definition, because his is a good one. He's a theologian that's uh, passed away just a few years ago. But for a long time, if you took a theology class at a Bible college, you had Charles Ryrie's book on theology, and he wrote this, faith means confidence, trust, to hold something is true. Of course, faith must have content. Faith has to have content. You can't just say, well, go have faith, brother. You have to have faith in something or someone. Faith must have content, and Ryrie continues, there must be confidence or trust about something. To have faith in Christ unto salvation means to have confidence that he can remove the guilt of sin and grant eternal life. That is a wonderful definition from a good theologian. Calvinists, though, they add to this definition, and they say that faith includes a commitment of obedience to the commands of Christ. And let me say right there, there's no one doubting that we ought to be obedient. Most people, when they come to place faith in Christ for the first time, don't really know what his commands are. It's difficult to make a commitment to that which you don't even know. But the issue isn't whether we ought to live right, and the issue isn't whether the Scripture tells us to live right. The issue is, can I not even become a child of God until I live good enough? That's going to be a real problem. It's the problem of trying to clean the fish before you catch them. It just doesn't work. But faith gets redefined. The very essence of the gospel depends on how you define faith. We talk every weekend on the gospel invitation to trust Christ. But if trust means a whole bunch of stuff and not just trust, 
Yeah, it changes it. Calvinists add in a commitment to obedience. I read what Wayne, uh, Wayne Grudem writes. He says this, it must include uh, a repentance, and that repentance is a heartfelt sorrow for sin, a renouncing of it, and hear this part, a sincere commitment to forsake it and walk in obedience to Christ. That's all contained within one word, faith. Then we have uh, Strong, who says it has a voluntary element. It's the surrender of the soul as guilty and defiled to Christ's governance. Again, we're putting the works into the faith so that the gospel we get out, we'll say it doesn't include works because we're just calling it faith, but what we've done is painted works red and called it something it ain't. And, and it guarantees the faith. This, this is how the doctrine comes up. And I think it's a serious error. And once you say, well, where's that at in the scripture? Well, it's, it's the, the stronghold that we're going to look at is James chapter 2. Uh, James chapter 2. And so we're going to spend some time there. And I'm going to try to show you it doesn't support this uh, notion of perseverance, but it does have something for all of us. Because James 2 speaks to believers. And I don't want anything I say today to be misunderstood to suggest that the Bible is inviting a Christian to just live any way they want without consequence. That is a flat-out lie. What it says is, though, it is not a difficult thing to receive what Christ has done for you. When you do that and become a child of God, you are now obligated to do right, and God will hold you accountable for doing right but that, that's just what it teaches. So we're going to look at James 2. James, you remember, is half-brother of, of Jesus, and that is he, he has an earthly father named Joseph and, and Mary. Uh, James had it hard growing up. I, I think sometimes when he would act up, G Mary would say, can't you be more like Jesus? So <laughs> y'all think y'all had it hard with an older, an older sibling. Uh, <laughs> but he came up in that, that and when Joseph had died, the family traveled with Jesus. You get that in John's gospel. And I say that to say this, a lot of what you'll read in the book of James are things that when you read it, you say, Jesus said that. Well, of course he did. James was there frequently. And he didn't always believe until, until later, but he heard a lot of what, is his, uh, what Jesus had said. And he heard a lot of things, especially from the Sermon on the Mount that sort of pop up in here. And he's dealing at the beginning of James 2 with something that can affect churches in any time period, and that's favoritism. Just treating certain people better, especially if you know they got a fatter wallet than somebody else. That's a real problem. And he was seeing it in churches in the first century, and so James is talking about that. And, and he says, like in verse 6 of James 2, you have despised the poor. Um, Do not the rich men oppress you? In other words, you're giving favoritism, you think somebody's got some more money, but a lot of the, the problems you have in your, your personal life are caused by rich folks who were able to take advantage of you. And um, he says, don't they oppress you? Verse 7 says, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called? And if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, that's favoritism, respect of persons. Don't think that doesn't happen. I, a friend of mine, his... His grandmother went to this church for a long time, and they did make sure everybody knew what you were giving, by the way. They posted it on the wall, and it determined how close the front. So there was people sitting on the front row, and you knew exactly how much they gave. See, that's, now you would think they'd do it in, in reverse. They, the people that don't give would be on the front row. They didn't do that. She always wanted to be on the front row. Isn't that favoritism? I mean, that's very crass, but, I mean, but, but people think this way. And that, that happened in... in uh, Sometimes people aren't treated as well. And this is a place where everybody has value and, and is loved. And that should always be expressed in what we do. And so he jumps on them. And he says, look, you can't be showing favoritism to people. Um, everybody has equal worth and, and dignity before God and value as someone that Christ died for. And, and we're to love one another. And so he talks about this royal law. You're to love one another. Where do you hear that from? Love your neighbor yourself. Well, Jesus said it. They said, how do you fulfill the righteousness, the holiness of God in the Old Testament. He said, you love God and you love people. Said, That's too complex. No, it's not. It's not complex to understand. Execution sometimes is the problem for us. And some people, I don't want to love. He said, love them anyway. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. You're set in a tall order. Yeah, that's right. But Jesus says, I did it. I did it, and, and you can too. So these people, they're told 
that you need to not show favoritism. And, and they're also told in verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point is guilty of all. You, know, you can't sort of hold yourself out just real proud. I'm, I'm so good. I'm living what Jesus wants me to live. And you're showing favoritism. You're falling short. A lot of times it's the little things that we, we overlook them. And James is, is picking them out. And he, he adds in verse 11, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. And if, if now if thou commit adultery, yet thou uh, kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now this begins to get to the key verse, which is verse 14, but I wanted you to see the build up to it. He just said something that should concern us. I thought when I accepted Christ, no matter what I did, I'm in. I mean, I'm going through the pearly gates. St. Peter's going to going to hand me my, my uh, what size halo do you wear? Here's your little harp to play. I'm assigning you to cloud number 329B, right? Um, we have such weird ideas about that. And, and then there's some who have gone the opposite direction, and they have this con concept of, of kind of a purgatory, that, you know, if you're not good enough, you're going to pay for all those things you did. And, and that's not in the Scripture either. But there is something in the Scripture where we're told that every Christian will stand before Christ. And he's mentioning this. See, I know he's talking about this because if I look at the whole of the New Testament, the only judgment that's ever discussed for a believer is the Bema judgment, as we sometimes call it, the judgment before Christ. I will read you one verse from another book. I'm not going to do a lot of flipping around today, but I will read something from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. It's a good verse for us. It's a, it's a simple one. And Paul talks to believers in the Corinthian church. They had every problem on the list. They're the poster child for church with a lot of problems. And, and none of us are perfect, but we see we learn a lot from, from them by looking at them. And Paul reminds them, you're not getting away with anything. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all all is you, me, Paul, all. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. Now, he builds that out in, in the first book to the Corinthians in chapter 3 there, and at the end later, I'm going to look at that a little bit. Um, he's not talking about purgatory, but what he is talking about, something Jesus frequently taught and James was familiar with, you know, Jesus would say things about laying up treasure in heaven. The way you live will result in rewards and inheritance in heaven, or not. And this judgment, you know, if, if you had a, a beautiful sparkling uh, engagement ring or a wedding ring, and you gave it to a jeweler to get some information about it, you're probably not trying to figure out if he got you a real diamond. That would be bad. But you ask the jeweler, how good are the cuts? What's the quality of the diamond. God is looking at our lives with a view to approval of a life well lived on the basis of the Word of God, and that will be lavishly rewarded. So this judgment is not a judgment in some kind of punitive sense. Sometimes when we hear judgment, we think woodshed, we think punitive. The word in Greek simply means a decision or determination. God's going to determine the quality of your faith as expressed how you lived out your life as a believer. And that's what Paul says. So in James, just have this in mind that the only judgment ever referenced in the New Testament for a believer, because your sins have already been paid for, He's only looking at the quality of your faith. And I don't mean faith in the gospel, that's settled. But did you believe the word of God when he said, love others as you love yourself? Did you believe it? You say, yeah, I believed it. Are you a doer of the word or a hearer only? That's what James said in chapter 1. Well, we need to be a doer of the word, that's obviously. That's what determines the quality of the diamond, a doer. So here in verse 12, so speak, you know, James 1 in kind of a thematic sentence, he said, be quick to listen and slow to speak. In other words, you need to pick your words carefully. Our words have the ability to bring life and death to people. They build people up and they tear them down. And here's the thing. A lot of the good things that people have said to me, I have forgotten. The encouragement, but they meant a lot then. But the bad things, I don't forget ever. I'm not saying a hold a grudge. I'm just telling you they're there. I have great recall of a lot of negative things that were said, and I think most of us do. So we need to be, especially as we mature, very judicious in our words, and it's very simple. If it won't 
edify, don't say it. That's the idea. See, and, and so I'm looking to build people up. There's people here today who need encouragement. Most of us need it. Some of us especially need it. It's easy to have a lot of bad things happen. We had a storm come through the other day. My neighbor had a huge oak tree land on their house. I think they could use some encouragement. It's hard, you know, the, the roof is crushed. Uh, these things happen. People need encouragement. So we think about what we say, and it's not just that. You may think you got away with it, and you may not even remember saying it, which is how it usually is when we say something stupid. We don't even remember it. It's written down. It's written down. He says, speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That law of liberty is the royal law from a couple of verses earlier. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. Was your speech loving? Were your actions loving? He shall have judgment without mercy that if showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against the judgment. Wow. You mean the standard at the Bema is, was I loving in my thoughts, in my words, and in my actions? Yeah. You know what love looks like in real time? A lot of times it looks like mercy. Are you a merciful person? Compassionate? You know, because if you are, that's what's rewarded. Now, I'm going to skip for a moment from verse 13 to chapter 3, verse 1. I want to show you something. We have what, you know, in technical terms, it's called an inclusio, but it's like a sandwich. You know, it's bookends. He introduces judgment in the two verses we just looked at. And when you get to chapter 3, verse 1, there's a chapter break. But chapter breaks were added a long time later. And in prior to the King James translation, uh, they don't mean that the thought ended in chapter 2. He's still talking about judgment in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, my brethren, like 19 or 20 times, he says brethren. He's affirming over and over. He speaks to Christians only. He says, my brethren, be not many masters. That's the word teachers. Be not many teachers. He has a mind taking a public role as a teacher, what I'm doing at this moment. He says this, you need to know something. You're going to be held to a greater condemnation. Why? Because you know better. You stood up in front of a group of people and told them they ought to be loving. I'm going to be looking at you. Ah, that shouldn't surprise us. I can remember uh, listening many times to a particular pastor um, uh, who's, who's been dead a long time, but who would preach on a particular issue, and that issue would be that which lost his whole ministry. But you are held to a higher standard. This has nothing to do with your eternal destiny. But when you're at the Bema, you can undo a whole lot of good by doing the very thing that you told people publicly not to do. You know what it makes you? We have a word for that. It's called a hypocrite. Nobody likes that. And it's the worst thing in the world for one who, who would stand up here to be a hypocrite because you're not getting away with anything. You will stand before Jesus. And I've looked. Um, apparently, you don't get a defense attorney. You don't get your mama there to say... Uh, as a character witness, he was a good boy. Yeah, this is tough. It's just you, your life. What quality is the faith? So with that in mind, let's look at 2.14. 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and he hath not works? The answer is it doesn't profit him anything if he has faith and no works. And can that faith save him? Of course not. Now, this has gotten people in all kinds of trouble thinking about this passage. And the, what the Calvinists use this for, they have an expression not found in the Bible, but it's a common one to hear, spurious faith or head faith, mental assent. And they would say, and in fact, I will I'll read here something. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this in his commentary on James 2. And this is someone you may have heard his name before. He says, James is asking what kind of faith is saving faith. He means saving so that you'll spend eternity in heaven. He makes it clear that no one is justified by a mere profession of faith. Anyone can say he has faith, but saying and having it are not the same thing. True faith always manifests itself in works. If no works follow from the faith, then the alleged faith is dead and useless. Abraham demonstrated his faith by his works. He showed he had true faith thus justifying his claim to faith. Abraham's profession of faith is vindicated in his demonstration of his faith in Genesis 22. You know what the problem with that is? Abraham made an expression of faith in Genesis 15, verse 6. Isaac wasn't born yet. 
Genesis 22 is when he sends a teenager named Isaac you know, on the mountain with him to be a sacrifice and tells the people with him, me and, and the boy are going to come, go up and worship and come back. It's decades later. You mean this man took a profession of faith named Abraham and it took decades to finally prove he was saved? You know, this all sounds good because we kind of have a reaction that says, well, of course, everybody's got to live good or they're not a real Christian. But it's never said in the scripture. It's never said. And this saving is talking about the judgment that he was just mentioning in the prior two verses. And what's being saved is not your spirit for heaven. You're going to stand before Christ as a, as a believer, and he's paid all your sin prices, right? And, and he, he's, you know, all that we owed, he, he's paid that. But as he examines your faith, whether or not, and what does your faith represent? It represents your life. It's your life on the balances. This is what you thought. It's what you said. It's what you did. And it's here, and this is your faith, as it were, lived out, your Faith in God's word, your belief in the things God said, actually expressed in your life, and, and he is weighing it, and if he rewards you for it, he has saved your life. He has delivered your life into eternity. Not you into eternity for heaven, but the sum and substance of who you were, the things people talk about after you're gone. That's translated into eternal rewards, which Jesus called laying up treasure in heaven. How do you lay up treasure in heaven? It's not by writing checks. It's by living your very best life now in the power of the Spirit. And this is what is being saved, and that's why he says, what does it profit? If this is about justification, like R.C. Sproul believed, then you must earn your salvation. He says, what does it profit? That's the word for you earning your paycheck. What does it profit you? And the answer is nothing. Why won't you profit if you had faith, but you're not a doer of the word? You'll have no rewards. That's why. But what if you were faithful? Now, you may not have money. You may not have position. And it don't matter because Jesus didn't have money and he didn't have rank, but he has inherited everything. And he said, I'm telling you, the first may be last, You pick out all the rich folks and the ones in Hollywood that tell us how to think, and some of those in Washington. The first will be last and the last first. So don't be upset when people cut in line. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of people that maybe seem more important to us and all that stuff. It don't matter. What matters is whether you're going to be first in line in heaven, not now. Will that faith profit him? No. Can it save him? It's not save his spirit, it's save his soul. If I flip back to James 1, just, just for a minute, to read something he wrote there. James 1.21 says, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You're a child of God, start acting like it. You're going to make an affirmative decision to get some garbage out of the house. Lay it aside. Receive with meekness that humility. Humility says, God, change me. I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. Change me by your engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And that word souls is life. It's able to save your life. How will it save my life? I'm going to live the life Christ wants, and he's going to reward me for it on the back end. And it will in that way last forever. So he says, can that faith save him? No, faith without works will get you no reward at the Bema. And you say, well, why do these people think it's something else? They need it to be something else. Sometimes you come with a commitment and and you find what's there. It's easy to do. We can all do it. We need to read carefully. What's he say in verse 15? If a brother or sister is naked, that means they don't have clothes. They don't have the basic essentials of life. They're destitute of daily food. What are you going to do? Now, you could have a fridge full of food. You bought two turkeys when they was on sale. And, and you can say, brother, I'm going to pray for you. God says, I brought these people to your life in this moment so you could live out my royal law that says to show mercy. And you didn't. When I look at the sum and substance of your life, when I examine the diamond, I'm going to find it's a cubic zirconia and you ain't getting a reward. You had an opportunity to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And one of you says, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. We ought to pray for people. God gives us the means and the opportunity 
to do good. Notwithstanding, you don't give them those things which are needful for the body, and what does it profit? And the answer is that the Bema judgment ain't going to profit you anything, and it's going to be embarrassing. Verse 17, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. It's, it's not dead like you're not going to heaven. Things can't be dead unless we are alive once. If, nothing was, if it was never alive, you don't talk about it being dead. But to be alive is to fulfill that which is the design purpose. Your design purpose as a child of God is to look more and more like Jesus in what you say and what you do. And Jesus would have given them some food. Even so, faith, if it has not wor- works, is dead. Now he says in verse 18, Yea, and, uh, a man may say he has faith. A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Now, James does something that's part of ancient a way of writing. He imagines an objector. They raise their hands. It's a hypothetical objector. But James, I don't agree with you. I think that faith doesn't necessarily produce this work, mercy. I think faith produces all manner of different works. And so this isn't, James sometimes gets quoted as if, as if verse 18 is him talking. He's talking about a hypothetical person. He even says it, yea, a man may say. He is not me. Amen. In the audience, Paul would do this frequently. May we uh, continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the objector. God forbid, right? And, and so a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He says they're not really locked together like you say. In fact, he even gives this objector, he does what a lot of people do who reject the word of God. They like to still use it sometimes. So this objector goes on. This isn't James talking. He's talking about what the objector says. Thou believest there's one God. Notice it's not the gospel. If he was talking about justification, us being saved from sin's penalty and, and, and going to heaven as our eternal destiny, he'd be talking about the gospel, but he's not. He's talking about Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 6, I think. It's, it's, the, it's the Shema. Every Jewish person knows it. Hear, O Israel, your Lord is one God, right? It's kind of like that. So uh, he says, you believe, maybe James, James, you believe there's one God, and you, you, know, and, and you do well. Based on your belief there's one God, you live good. But the demons, the devils, they also believe there's one God, and they shake and tremble. The same faith, the same belief in something produced trembling or doing well. And that's his argument. And James says, but wilt thou know, O vain, that means empty man, that faith without works is dead. This faith in, the, in, in believing what God's word says in the royal law if it's not producing the kind of works which is explicitly loving your neighbors yourself, when you stand at the Bema, it's dead. It's not doing what it was designed to do. Now he gives examples, and I won't tarry there long, but one example is Abraham. He was justified by works, it says. In Romans 4, it says he was justified by faith. You know, in Romans, he's justified. That, that word means vindicated, pronounced innocent, before God. God reads your hearts, and even if you don't always act like you should, even if I don't always act like I should, he, he knows my heart. He knows whether I'm a believer. Um, people don't. We think we do. We sometimes think about people's motivations as if we could see in there, but we don't. All I can see is your actions and your words that I hear. And I do expect a Christian to not say certain things. I do expect a Christian ought to live better. And Abraham was a man that had some failures, but he's a man that grew in faith immensely as you read through several chapters of his life in the book of Genesis. And he was a man whose life was justified or vindicated before the people around him. They could see that this man was radically changed by God, by his living out his faith. And it's justification here before men. And that's a justification that's done on works. And it's real simple. The royal law of loving other people... You can't do that with no one seeing it. At a minimum, the person you're loving on is going to see it, right? It's it's not a closet sort of thing where you can just do it in secret. You may be able to pray in secret, but when you start loving other people and doing for them, they're going to see it. People could see Abraham when he had offered Isaac. This was because he told them, we're going to go worship and we're coming back. He didn't know how it's all going to work out, but God said this young man is going to be a progenitor of a nation. 
And that means even though I'm supposed to go up and do a sacrifice, he's living. He didn't know all, all about it, but he just went. God keeps us on a need-to-know basis, and he went with what God said. He trusted who was driving and didn't quit, keep saying, where are we going? Thing. And you, you see then he uses, he says that the scripture was fulfilled, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed for him to righteousness. It was fulfilled in the sense that now people could see it outwardly, not just in his heart, and that's why he was called the friend of God. And then he uses um, a, a Rahab as an example. Verse 24, you said, you, you see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Before men, you're justified, and that's the kind of living rewarded at this judgment that's based on whether you were merciful, loving, compassionate. What about Rahab? Here's this woman. All she knew about God was what she heard by rumor, because she's not Jewish. She's over there on the other side of the, of, of the river. Uh, and, and as they came in to the promised land, as, as Joshua brings them in, and Joshua too, this woman uh, protects the spies that go in to Jericho to look around. You, you, the spies don't even have names as you're reading the story. She's the hero. And she heard about this God. Other people had too. It wasn't a secret. You don't go splitting the Red Sea open and have no one hear about it and kill part of Pharaoh's army. She heard about it, but her response was different, responded with faith. And her faith caused her to protect the spies at the potential loss of her own life. And that is faith lived out. That gets rewarded at the bayment. It's a wonderful example. So he says in verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It's not doing that which was its design purpose. So we have here this notion of perseverance. And, and, and to say that people have to live a life of good works or they're not really a believer starts with what is faith. And uh, folks are looking at this passage and saying, see, this is about spurious faith, false professions. People come down to the front and they cry a few tears. They didn't really believe. And the reason is they didn't commit to obedience. And we read the passage and it doesn't say any such thing. Trusting Christ means exactly that and no more. Yeah, we're called to be someone who's growing in Christ, but to become a child of God is not a complex thing. We're not uh, having you jump through rings of fire because the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Uh, And neither does James chapter 2. So I want to show just an alternative view as we bring this to a close. And I want to show you something in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have that, I want you to look there. I said earlier something about this Bema judgment. James is talking about it, but Paul would write the Corinthian letters later than James, and he would refer to it as the Bema judgment. Uh, it was a common a concept in their century because in a city there would be a, a literal seat that a ruler would sit on to, to judge things, to make decisions. And so he uses something that they know. And in 1 Corinthians 3, he builds out this idea and gives us a lot of content on it. So we'll start in verse, um, uh, I'm, the, I'm in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll start in about verse 10. Well, verse 9 I'll start. For we are laborers together with God, your God's husbandry, your God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I've laid the foundation, and another has built it thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. We'll just stop there a moment. You know, the foundation is Christ. We know that. Any other foundation, just sand. But as we build on his work in our life, and we all have a ministry like Paul did, and our ministry is especially to love others and show mercy like James was talking about. It's not hard. It's not hard. It will cost you something, and it will inconvenience you. But it is what we're to do to be like the Savior. And we do that, and, and we're building on this foundation and, and when we stand before Christ, though, a picture of how this works is, I'll just test it by fire. You know, Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. Are you putting in heaven gold, silver, and precious stones? That's the kind of thing you want to be putting in the heavenly bank account. No one can take it, not even the IRS. Or you can put wood, hay, and stubble. How long does it last when the fire comes down? See, he says it'll be tested by fire. See, all that, that stuff, and that may be stuff that isn't, doesn't mean it's a sin or some bad thing you did. It's just stuff that 
didn't do anything uh, with regard to someone else, and you weren't loving somebody, it, it may have been you know, going fishing instead of going to church. It's wood, hay, and stubble. That's all it is. And, and it burns up because it's rebuilt by fire, and the fire, fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. Hmm. Uh, if any man's work abide, that's gold, silver, precious stones put in the heavenly account. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he will receive a reward. Nothing about heaven and hell. But look at this next verse. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. See, it's not, people say, it's just good enough of I'm in. You're going to care. You're going to care at this moment. Whether you were obedient, it matters. And he says he'll suffer loss. Why, loss of what? Loss of the gold, silver, and precious stones he could have spent his life doing rather than squandering time. Not loss of salvation. Um, Think about this guy. He gets up. He's there before Christ. They put it all in two baskets. There's the gold, silver, precious stone basket, the wood, hay, and stubble. One of them baskets is empty. Now, I'm asking you, what did his life look like? All right, that's what we're talking about. Sins Christians can't do. They've got to persevere to the end in fruitfulness and good works. How is it this man shows up at the Bema and the basket's empty? Yeah, it's a real problem. And it tells us this perseverance idea is wrong. Now again, I've said it, I'm not saying it don't matter how you live. There are a lot of consequences for being um, sinful, for doing that which God said not to do. But none of them are that your eternal destiny will be in hell. This man is the person who, who no doubt did some good things, but in the final balance, his life fundamentally went up in smoke. And that's a shame. And you and me observing might have thought all kinds of things. Well, he can't be a believer, and we were wrong. We were wrong. This man, it says, and Paul's clear, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Don't start pushing everybody into hell. In fact, I'd recommend you not do it to anybody unless you, you've actually been told by them they reject Christ. You know, this, this 1 Corinthians 3 is, is a telling passage. This doctrine of perseverance this doctrine steals away our assurance. It does. We, we can't know we're saved because we can never know if we're good enough, and we don't know if maybe next year we'll just run off track and not come back. Right? Maybe I say, well, I've done good so far. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we got report cards. I don't get those anymore, and I praise God for that. Uh, <laughs> but when, you know, and, and I know now, see, like maybe sometimes people are allowed to make like C's. In my house growing up, that wasn't permitted. So one had great foreboding and wringing of hands when you know report cards was coming out. I'm like in the third grade because bad grades were not tolerated, especially bad grades in conduct. And what I would tell you, if you grade our country or me or this church only by what you perceive to be the failures, you will give us an F. You will give the country an F. You will give me an F every time. Do not grade people by their failures, because that's the appeal of this doctrine, to grade people by their failures, and God's not in that business. He sees the heart, and at the Bema, he's going to look at those successes, and we need not grade people by their failures. We tend to have PhDs in picking out the faults of others, a preschool education, and looking at the mirror at our own lives. There's a temptation to make our perception of ourselves and the standards we meet be the standard we meet out to other people, and I don't think I'm qualified. I don't think I'm qualified to judge you, and so I shouldn't do it. I don't think you're qualified to judge me. I know the Bible says something about church discipline when there's a publicly flaunted issue, but we need to be mindful. We need to be humble. Well, let me say this. Make no mistake. It does matter how we live, and James says that. What would profit you? You don't want to show up in front of Jesus with a sack, of, a sack of, of wood hand stubble. You just don't. We ought to know what Jesus said about living well. And a lot of it's just not hard. He says, show mercy. People are going to come into your lives that need some mercy. Show mercy. The life Jesus wants for us, though, it don't begin with works. It begins with faith because no one can ever be good enough. New life begins with trusting Jesus alone as your sin bearer. We're going to have a, a time of invitation now.